support the creative writing minor. He was also associate producer for the Brisbane Writers Festival. In 2014, he won the Text Prize for Children and Young Adults Writing for his memoir, How to Be Happy, which was published this year. A funny, sad and serious memoir, How to Be Happy, is David Burton's story of his turbulent life at high school and beyond. Feeling out of place and convinced that he is not normal, David has a rocky start. How to Be Happy tackles depression, friendship, sexual identity, suicide, academic pressure, <coughs> love and adolescent confusion. It's a brave and honest account of one man, young man's search for a happy, true and meaningful life that will resonate with readers young and old. I've read it, it certainly did for me. And in reading How to Be Happy, I was immediately transported to the awkward years in high school and struggles associated with that confusing period between childhood and adulthood, and also between school and uni, and then the time after uni and before you get your first full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> the time in which you were trying to work out who you are for the first time without immediate reference to your friends and family. I highly recommend giving it a read and handing it to those teens who are still in the midst of the confusion of that transitional period. So can you please join the confusion of that transitional period? So can you please join me in welcoming David to the Off my chest. 
test, alright? Because I don't think these kids in these schools today are like me when I was young. I remember us being friendlier. <laughs> way, way less connected to our phones. It was before iPhones, so, you know, we looked up and we looked into people's eyes. We weren't nearly as shallow. We were way more respectful. We were kinder to our elders. Between the Kardashians' Call of Duty and Snapchat, this generation is better. <laughs> Someone famous once said this better than I. He said, what is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders. They disobey their parents. They ignore the law. Their morals are decaying. What is to become of them? That was Plato. <laughs> Hesiod, in the 8th century, said the youth of today were reckless and impatient and the future of the human race was absolutely stuffed. <laughs> Not his words, I may have altered. <laughs> Peter the Hermit, in 1274, said the youth was self-centred, and on and on and on through history we can find these quotes. So I'm not going to spend much time today talking about the corrupting power of technology, or the unusual position that young people find themselves in at this particular point of history, because I don't think they're that special. I simply don't buy the fact that they are that corrupted. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are, there are people in this room who are much better qualified to tell you about the latest technologies that connect young people to each other and to support services. Many of you are here. Indeed, it's a peculiar time to grow up, that is true. But so were the 70s, so were the 80s and 90s. It's always tough being young. You feel the world is against you, you want to make your place on the planet, but your parents are too busy being lame to care. <laughs> I want to emphasise this point because there's a um, there's a, an impulse to dismiss the young people as having incredibly short attention spans and ADD and ADHD and how can we get these young people to read and engage? I was in a, I've been promoting the book the last couple of months, which means I've been travelling around the country, and I was in a regional library in regional Queensland, I won't say that, in a in a library, and I walked into this library to do a lesson with, um, a workshop with older people about writing a memoir. And uh, I walked into the young adult section that was very, <laughs> that was in a corner, and I walked in and disturbed a crow that was nesting in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and there were cobwebs. And, um, and I looked across and there were like, there was the, an ordinary kind of wall of young adult novels and this, this a few books about a few comic books, and I congratulated the librarian there um, on her selection of comic books for young people, and she said, oh, I don't really like supplying that for that. I just think if we haven't engaged people when they're 13 with reading by that age, you know, why, why bother? <laughs> so I found that incredibly depressing, <laughs> uh, and looked around, and was not surprised at the fact that there was no one in her freaking library. Um, <laughs> I think there's a, and I get this a lot, and it's easy, it's so easy to become cynical, and I do it all the time as well, when I walk into a drama classroom and every person under the age of 16 is attached to a phone, you go, how can we possibly hold, how can we possibly compete for their attention? The argument that young people have shorter and shorter attention spans is, to a certain extent, backed up by research and so on. However, they are also the generation, don't forget, that proved the publishing industry wrong by selling a million copies of The Order of the Phoenix and sitting and reading it voraciously. They're a generation that will download podcasts and listen to interviews that go for two, two and a half hours at a stretch because they love it. They will sit and watch video games streaming on Twitch live services. They will watch someone in Korea playing StarCraft 2 for three or four hours at a time. It isn't difficult, I would argue, to capture this audience's attention. It's just that we need to be very mindful about how we do that and the type of content. So I don't give much shred to this idea that they're bugging. I think that's the easy way out. That was one of my tangents that I embraced because I have the time. <laughs> so, it's not like I'm qualified to make rules or anything, and I don't like rules, but here's the first rule about <laughs> connecting with young people. And it's the first rule I learned when I was 20 and trying to be Mr. Cool. Don't pretend you're a teenager and you understand everything about them and where they're coming from. You're not a teenager and you don't understand. And thank God for that. Being a teenager is hard work and chaotic. 
It's only in retrospect that I begin to put a framework around the entire mess of my teenage years. I can now build some kind of narrative or story to make sense of it. My entire adolescence was framed by two questions. Who am I? And how do I get people to like me? <laughs> of course, as an adult, I have these questions answered. I never think about them at any point, ever. <laughs> as an adult, my main questions are now, when is the next Rego Jew? <laughs> and where can I find the wine? <laughs> and why does One Direction have no chest hair? <laughs> but as a teenager, who am I and how do I get people to like me were my driving questions. Who am I was an important one. I had come from a small town country primary school where I knew absolutely everyone and knew where I fit in. And I was thrust into a large private high school in the city. City in my eyes. It was Toowoomba. <laughs> but a city where I knew absolutely no one. Who was I in this chaotic mess? Because I instantly sensed that there was a social ladder going on and I didn't know how to interpret it. I knew a few things about the guy I wasn't. I wasn't the sporty, masculine jock, which may surprise you given my athletic form <laughs> today. I knew I wasn't the ducks of any particular subject. I was bright-ish, but not quite bright enough or bothered enough to get to the top of that particular pile. I was gangly, I had long limbs, I had a lot of hair on my legs, but mysteriously at that point, nowhere else on my body. <laughs> and I didn't quite know who I was. I knew a few things about who I wasn't, but I didn't know where I fit in. One thing I did know about myself was that I loved stories. Loved them. From the age of seven, libraries were my favourite places on earth. And they still are. Wizard of Oz was the first book I read by myself. I still remember the fresh feeling of achievement that this gave me, as well as the hours of peaceful concentration I spent in careful study. The prepubescent years revealed some foundational spiritual texts for me. The words of people like Morris Gleitzman, Robin Klein, Andy Griffiths, who's done a few things since I was young, I don't know if you know that name, <laughs> Emily Rodder, also a very small time, you may have known <laughs> Paul Jennings, John Marsden, the list goes on. This is not to mention the first time I watched Star Wars, the time I borrowed a VHS, which is media that you can touch. <laughs> I borrowed a VHS from my library called Doctor Who and the City of Death. Or even that time I discovered the dusty pile of comic books in the bottom of our hallway cupboard and was introduced to the X-Men. Before it had anything to do with Patrick Stewart or James McAvoy doing this. <laughs> Note that I say I'm a fan of stories, not books, and there's a difference. I'm a big fan of books, absolutely, but books are no wor better or worse than comic books, movies, or television. They're all stories, after all. They all create a conversation and inspire fan communities. They all satisfy that need for story that's a deep human instinct. Because, of course, I'm not the only fan of story. All human beings enjoy story. Even the most stubborn, illiterate teenager likes story. At any age, we all relish in a colleague or friend dishing out fresh gossip at lunchtime. Even a teenager who has never read before will be a fantastic storyteller at lunchtime. Oh my goodness, did you hear about Teresa? She's totally got the cost blah, 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 blah. What is that if not communal storytelling? It's exactly what we've been doing since the Stone Age. Not only is listening to story hardwired, Storytelling is too. For example, I was in Woolworths the other day and I was walking through the aisles, walking through the fruit and oh my goodness, I can see you, man. Uh, walking through the fruit and vegetables section. And I noticed just out of the corner of my eye there was this old woman kind of following me, but she was picking up the exact groceries that I was picking up as I went, like just one kind of two steps behind me. And then we got to the Mandarin kind of section and we stood at the Mandarin and we reached over. Now, how many of you have made up the rest of your story in your head already? <laughs> how many of you want to hear the end of the story? Yes. Too bad I made it up, there is no <laughs> <laughs> But even that was four or five sentences. The instinct to complete a story, the instinct to tell a story and share a story is hardwired. Aristotle knew this, the ancient Greeks knew this, they embedded story inside their community. So don't think, don't make the mistake of thinking that teenagers are absent for it, because it is a deep human need. I know all, you know all of this, of course, I'm preaching to the converted. We are all storytellers, 
and story things. Some young people, particularly in a school environment, haven't been told in that late date, no creativity required. Libraries, that close but quirky cousins of schools, take up a unique quadrant in our children's educational experience because they are, after all, places where young people often go to experiment with pursuits and ideas that may seem out of place elsewhere. But again, more on this later. That was also foreshadowing. <laughs> Great. It is stories that I advocate for. Books are important, but respect for story is more important. I am consistently relieved when I walk into a school or town library and see entire walls of the young adult section dedicated to manga and graphic novels. I haven't met a single librarian yet who hasn't confessed that these sections are the absolute busiest and the most in demand by young readers. And I can't say I blame young readers. After a school day where I'm worried about grades, the girls I fancy, and the enormous amount of hormones flooding my body, I'm not exactly going to settle in for an evening of reading Tolstoy recreationally. I want simplicity and fun. Manga and comics have that down. And I'm a guy who read and loved Hamlet at the age of 10. I'm pretty frickin' literate. <laughs> but the reading list from the last two weeks of my adult life has been, I kid you not, Teen Titans Volume 1. Fates and Furies by Lauren Groff, which is a novelist who's been nominated for the National Book Award in America and is getting a lot of critical noise. Batman and Robin, Volume 5. Link Hack, which is a maker. Simply Nigella by Nigella Lawson. <laughs> a Brief History of Seven Killings by Marlon James, which just won the Man Booker. And A School of Blue Thread by Anne Tyler, also shortlisted for the Man Booker. All of those titles, bar one, by the way, I got from my local library. For those who are interested, I purchased. Simply Nigella. <laughs> <laughs> because a new cookbook by Miss Lawson just has to be purchased in our household. I'm afraid of the law. <laughs> so there we go 50 50 comic books and other literary contemporary content. Stories are stories. To say some stories aren't as legitimate as others is like saying country music or rap music isn't music or gluten free food isn't actual food. It's a sign of an ignorant and unintelligent snob. It's also a really quick way to offend or permanently hurt someone who is a fan of the subject of your derision. Rule two, apparently I'm making rules. Don't shame a young person for their curiosity or their pleasure. Don't shame a young person for their curiosity or their pleasure. Shame, wielded by an authority hand, creates lifelong scars. And you can bet, if they have the option, they won't be interacting with the institution that you symbolise for, possibly, the rest of their lives. And awfully, they will turn into parents who steal their children away from your institution. It only takes one snobbish dismissal to turn away a generation or two from the library. When I met that librarian who casually dismissed that rock wall of comic books, I could see why they weren't online, or why the, that particular corner of her library was entirely absent. Stories are stories. And I think we can all agree that anything that gets young people reading is a good thing. And libraries take up this particular special square because it was in libraries that I read naughty things that I went and read. It was in libraries that I went and read in private a um, book about sexual anatomy because I wanted to know what a urethra was. <laughs> if you'd like to know, I can tell you after. <laughs> Thank you, local library. It was libraries that found Doctor Who, which in, uh, opened up a whole new television series and sci-fi that led me to Isaac Asimov and du Douglas Adams and Ursula Le Guin and Margaret Atwood that led me further down the line. If we just start on the right step, then they do open the doors. So, I was shamed for my pleasure by my peers upon arriving at high school. My peers wanted to answer this question of who was I by responding with, you're a nerd, baby, or a loser. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about my time at high school. Let's cut to day five of year eight, because back in Queensland, we uh, used to start high school in year eight. So this is my day, oh, fifth day of high school. And I am across a visual arts table, and a young gentleman by the name of Cameron has me by the neck, kind of leaning over me. And he sneers into my face, I could snap you like a tweet. Now, Cameron had no identity crisis going on. Cameron knew exactly who he was. He had spiky hair, uh, and he wore shorts down the here, <laughs> and he never tucked his shirt in, and he didn't wear a hat at lunchtime. <laughs> so he was captain, I know. If you say that to a school group, they go, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
a big deal. So he was the bully. But Cameron was the closest relationship I had in high school at that time. We conversed every day. True, it was a conversation about what an idiot I was, but we conversed every day. Now, we were in this position, him leaning over me, him saying I could snap you like a twig, because in fairness I called him an idiot. But I called him an idiot because he called me a naughty word starting with F and ended with A. And he said that, and I'd said idiot, and he'd go, right across the table. Now, he was the closest relationship I had, except for another young man. First day of high school, I'm standing trying to pay very desperately not to get anybody's attention. When I hear a voice from behind me go, Do you like cheese? Just like that. <laughs> and I turn around, and it's this young man, also in year eight. He's got greasy, messy hair tied up in a ponytail. He's got clothes that look like they've been thrown on him from about three blocks away. <laughs> uh, they're all too different. And he's got a backpack in which he apparently has put every book known to man kind of weighing him down closer to the ground. This is Ray. And I answer Ray's question, do you like cheese, with an honest but cautious yes. <laughs> and then he talks at me for five to ten minutes about cheese. Once he's done with cheese, he moves on to his next topic, which is Pokemon. He talks to me about, at that time, all 150 Pokemon. Now, there are six billion of them. After Pokemon, he moves on to his next topic, which is reciting every single line from every single movie of, that involves Austin Powers or Mike Myers. He can recite every single line at the top of his head. And somewhere in the middle of all of that, I go, Ray, you're a bit special, aren't you? And I'm able to recognise instantly that Ray has Asperger's Syndrome or Autism. Now, I'm able to diagnose that because I've grown up with two younger brothers who have Asperger's Syndrome or Autism. Now, ordinarily when I'm talking to kids, I explain what Asperger's Syndrome or Autism is. However, I feel like there's a communal understanding about what, what that is. It's a social or communicative disorder that often leads to a feeling of isolation and an inability to read people's reactions in real time. And as custodians of libraries, we probably have a lot of autistic or people with Asperger's hanging out in the library because they're quiet places, they're places with a predictable routine, and there are places where they can go and pursue their obsessions. Because the other thing about people with autism or Asperger's is that they have an incredible capacity for memory. And their obsessive compulsive disorder kind of part of them allows them to latch onto subjects that they're incredibly passionate about. So a large group of people at NASA have been diagnosed with Asperger's or autism. Um, we know now in retrospect that a lot of geniuses through the ages have probably exhibited behaviours of Asperger's or autism. You read about biographies of Beethoven or Einstein, we can kind of recognise that in them. My brothers, Andy and Chrissy, who are two years younger than me and twins, can recite off the top of their head to this day every single line of every single episode of Friends, every single line of every single episode of Thomas the Tank Engine, every single line of every single episode of Family Guy, a lot of episodes of South Park, and some episodes of The Simpsons. More than that, they reach into this dialogue as a means of expressing themselves. So these pop culture stories are in fact the way that they communicate how they're feeling, and did for a long time as young people. So, from under the age of 10, if Andy and Chrissy were having a fight, Andy would not be able to say, Andy would not have the brain function to go into his brain and summon up the emotive language of bugger off Chrissy, you're frustrating me. Instead, he would take on the personality of Homer Simpson, become Homer Simpson yelling at Bart in the exact intonation with all the mannerisms that he can interpret of Homer, which is quite funny to watch. But it's also quite alarming when you realise that this is how they communicate. So I grew up in a house that I shared with Peter and Stewie Griffin and Homer Simpson <laughs> and Colin Lane and Frank Woodley and Thomas the Tank Engine and the Fat Controller, which was an enchanting experience. <laughs> but also told me a lot about how stories for some people are literally the modes of communication, are literally the metaphor that they reach for in order to communicate what is going on inside of their heads. And it's something that we all do, naturally. It's just for people with autism or Asperger's, that's how they lean on. And in fact, stories are the modes of education that teach us how to interact with the world. It's just that for some people we can interpret that through a filter of metaphor or figurativeness. But we do this as young people. When we see someone we really like, like Miley Cyrus or Justin Bieber or Tyler Oakley or the Vault Brothers or um, PewDiePie or any of these people that young people really look up to. We want to wear their personality. I wanted to be the doctor. 
That's who I wanted to be. He was perfect. He was quirky. He was funny. A lot of, he had a lot of young women around him constantly kind of looking up to him. But there was no kind of pressure to be sexual. I was like, great. I can be that guy. And I wanted to be that guy. That's how I communicated and framed my experience with the world. But growing up with the boys meant a couple of interesting experiences. For example, we're running around the backyard as six or eight year olds playing like we usually do. <laughs> right, a bit more enthusiastically than that. Bit, you know what I mean? uh, and when all of a sudden Chrissy lies down, <laughs> gone. Nothing going on in his eyes. He's uh, breathing, uh, his eyes are open. Andy and I are standing over him going, hello, nothing. We rush inside. Mum, Chrissy's dead. <laughs> Mum goes, oh, I should check this out. We go into the backyard. No response. Mum goes, yep, this is weird. Rushes inside, brings the doctor. Doctor says, yes, you should bring him in. We run, poor mum, like dad's at work. She bundles three kids into an ambulance. The sirens, the whole works, right? Possible neurological damage of an asperger's child. No cause for good, sir. Run into the hospital, doctor's going, yeah, this is weird, I'll be back in a tick. The second the doctor leaves the room, Chrissy's up again playing. <laughs> like nothing's happened. And mum and I go, Chrissy, what? What, uh, what just happened now? What? Nothing. No, Chrissy, you were knocked out like an hour. What happened? I said, oh, I was Superman, affected by kryptonite. <laughs> <laughs> His commitment to the role was stunning. <laughs> We had exactly the same reaction you did, which was a <laughs> And we said, get in the car. <laughs> this is the boys. The line between stories and reality is blurred. And they're a constant reminder of how fragile that line is, particularly when you're young. The, you are in such a mode of sponge kind of absorption of the stories you're being told that you take them on and they inform your experience of the world, which is another point I'll get to later. I'll tell you one more story because I've got the time, and it involves a. It, <laughs> I don't get to tell this story to young people because some schools don't like it. Um, <laughs> uh, we're older now, 13, 15, and, uh, and we're constantly trying to get the boys to have, you know, improve their life skills, their ability to interact with the world. So we're in Woolworths, and Mum says to Chrissy, Chris, can you go up to the deli counter and just ask for some about 500 grams of leg ham because we need that for sandwiches, right? Chrissy goes, no worries. Abby goes to the Woolworths counter, sees a young lady behind the counter, and he goes, ah, pretty young lady, in his mind, pretty young lady, mm -hmm. I want to impress this pretty young lady, what should I do? To impress pretty young ladies, you make them laugh. How can I make them laugh? I'll go through this tremendous library of pop culture knowledge and lines in my head, and pick out a one that I think would make, that would be both socially appropriate, <laughs> and would make the young lady laugh at this particular point. So the young lady says, what would you like? And he says, hi, can I have a dozen chicken vaginas, please? <laughs> That's a line from Family Guy. <laughs> the confused 14-year-old goes, we don't, we don't have chicken vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> and I run over at this point and go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I split them up. Because something weird happened at around 12 or 13, which was I started getting embarrassed. Because something clicks over when you're 12 or 13. Before that, I'd kind of been, they'd been my quirky younger brothers, and I kind of understood, and we, had, we were friends, and I hung out with them, played with them. When I was 12 or 13, I became consumed with how I fit in, and wanted to be normal. So any part of my life that I didn't think was normal, or was a bit too difficult to explain, I started putting distance between. And that meant that I grew distant from my brothers, which, when they entered there, it's troublesome and very difficult to go with. This is all rather getting away from the fact that Cameron had me by the neck across the visualized table. So, Cameron had me by the neck across the visualized table, and he would sneers into my face, I could snap you like a twig. And I said, yes, you probably could, which was not the answer he was expecting. At this point, the teacher on the other side of the room, who is in her, she's a first year teacher out of uni, and she's thinking in her head, I'm joking, you're wrong, Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> she manages to yell out something, and Cameron kind of backs away as a confused gorilla, and he says, I'll get you at lunchtime, Burton. Um, and at lunchtime, I run away with Ray to the library, and we talk about Pokemon in the library. Which is good, because Cameron didn't know what a library was. <laughs> and that was pretty much year eight. That was pretty much my first year of high school. My world changed in year nine when I discovered drama. Drama was like mana from heaven. It was fantastic. 
And something happened in my first drama class where we were improvising, we were making a scene up on the spot, where I took a risk and I got up. Because for the moment, they do. Our entire sense of who we are and how we connect with the rest of the world, and keep in mind the rest of the world at this point is high school, is defined by the story we tell ourselves. And Crazy Drama Day was my story. It was who I was. Crazy Drama Day came with some baggage that I wasn't expecting. Crazy Drama Day meant that I could be funny, I could even handle that awful time called sport <laughs> by leaping around the soccer field like an idiot and making people laugh. But it came with some baggage, meaning that because I liked musical theatre, because I found it easier to get along with women more than I did so with men, the most common insult held against me was gay or poofda, which is a true sign of intelligence from the person who says that. But, and at school, I was fine with that, because I could say something like, why are you offering, and they would go, oh. <laughs> and their brain would short circuit, and they'd run to a teacher, David, come on to me. No, I'm sorry, you came on to me. Right? <laughs> but in the privacy of my bedroom, at home, where I was not crazy drama day, at home, I would come home exhausted by the entire experience of being crazy drama day at school, and I would sit at home and not speak. I would be a weird, silent alien to my parents who were going, who is this child? I wouldn't sleep, I wouldn't eat, I wouldn't interact. I would just kind of go and watch oodles of Star Wars or read lots of Harry Potter and sit in my bedroom and gaze up at the ceiling and occasionally wonder with a little voice in my head going, what if I'm gay? What if no one likes me? I don't find the idea of men entirely repulsive. Like, the idea of a naked man doesn't make me vomit the second I think of it. Surely that means I'm gay, but I don't want to be gay. I'm not gay, damn it, I'm not gay. So by the time I get to grade 11, I'm going, I'm not gay, look at how not gay I am, I need a girlfriend. <laughs> I'm 15 years old, I haven't even kissed anyone, which basically makes me a monk. <laughs> I haven't got a girlfriend, I need a girlfriend. Right, how do I get a girlfriend? <laughs> this is how I got to get a girlfriend. Now, I don't want to... No spoilers, but I don't want to give away. I lie at some point in this next interaction. See if you can pick it up. <laughs> I spot a pretty girl, Tiff. We're friends from drama class. I know how to make her laugh. I can do it with Tiff. I say to Tiff, Hi Tiff, a bunch of us are going to the movies <laughs> on the weekend. Would you like to come? She says, sure. A day later. Hi Tiff, everybody else cancelled. <laughs> it's, it's just you and I. Would you still like to come? Sure. <laughs> Checked her into a date. <laughs> we go on the date to the movies. With further evidence that I'm not gay, we see Chicago. <laughs> we sit and watch Chicago, and after Chicago, we're sitting in the audience giggling and laughing as teenagers do, and she says, Is there anyone at school that you like? <laughs> Well picked up. <laughs> and I say, maybe. Is there anyone at school that you like? And she says, maybe. <laughs> and then she says, is there anyone at school that you like? And I say, well, we cut forward four hours. <laughs> we dip the bottom of that particular repugnant adolescent mating ritual well. And we go, oh my gosh, we like each other, let's go out, yay! And I skip manfully home. <laughs> I have a girlfriend. Right, girlfriend, I have a girlfriend, yes, not gay, hello, call me gay, check out my girlfriend. <laughs> Crazy drama day with a girlfriend, straight away, yes. <laughs> now what? I have no idea. I have no idea what comes next. It occurs to me vaguely in my mind that I'm supposed to be romantic and kiss her at some point. I do not know how to kiss someone. Do you just talk to them and then kind of go, <laughs> <laughs> That kind of seems like an attack. That seems like an attack. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I maybe we dance. Like, because that's what you see in films. Like, you need to dance in the rain. But Jordan was in a drought. And I came up with this idea that I was like, I'll kiss her gently on the forehead. <laughs> and then on the nose, and then on the mouth. So she knows it's coming. <laughs> so that if halfway she goes, oh my god, he's gonna kiss me, she can go, oh, kiss, gross, yeah, and throw up in my face. Because that's what I'm certain is gonna happen. I think this woman is gonna throw up in my face. Because I swear I'm gonna be crap at this. I don't know how to do this, right? 
we get to, we decided to go out on the Sunday. By the Friday, right, we're going to, I know this is it, because we're going to split up for the weekend, we're not going to see each other, except we're going to talk on MSN, which is this arcane <laughs> technology. It's <laughs> shut on Facebook these days, we talk on MSN. And um, I'm like, okay, this is it, and the schoolyard goes deserted. And it's just her and I, and I know this is it, this is my time. And she looks up at me with these big, beautiful blue eyes, and she says, okay, I'll see you next week. And I say, okay. And she says, all right. And we look at each other. There's a long silence. There's a voice in my head going, kiss her, for love, don't kiss her. Just kiss her. Just kiss her. There's another loud voice in my head going, don't do it, run for your life, stop! <laughs> Every man for himself, hurry up! <laughs> There's another voice in my head going, gay, 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 gay. Shut, up. <laughs> shut up, other voice! I'm trying to kiss my girlfriend. <laughs> so we're looking into each other's eyes. The silence is still there. And I say, Bye, and I'll leave. <laughs> I freak out. Because I didn't know how to do this thing. And a week later, I was still consumed with so much anxiety, so much doubt about being this gallant romantic guy that I thought I needed to be, this story that I was telling myself that I'd gotten from different places, that, I'm a, that I let that relationship go. Previous to that, I had another important female friendship, my best friend, who in the book is called Mary, and we loved each other and we made each other laugh and she saved me from this social kind of isolation. We discovered Harry Potter together, which in the realm of like discovering things is like the most important life event ever for me. And we did that and talked about Doctor Who and Red Dwarf and all these dorky things. And then at some point she turned up at school with marks on her wrist. I was in about grade nine and I couldn't understand what was going on. And it slowly dawned on me that she was hurting herself, that she was self-mutilating. And these scars would get fresher and redder and more aggravated. Her moods would go up and down. And she made me promise not to tell anyone or she would kill herself, right? So I, as male best friend, went, I need to save this girl. And I took that on myself as a 14-year-old. Of course, it didn't end well. She got worse. I did all sorts of things. I tried to make her laugh, tried to tell her how amazing she was. And she went down this deep dark well until eventually, after about 18 months of this particular relationship, I finally went to a school counsellor and told them, at which point Mary didn't speak to me anymore. And I lost that friendship. Unfortunately, at school at that time, I wasn't learning about how to deal with self-mutilating friends or how to deal with a girlfriend and how to kiss her. I was learning about the rules of a perimeter and um, quadratic equations. And I was learning about critical discourse and Wuthering Heights um, and studying Romeo and Juliet. The place where I found the most salvation and the most healing for those problems, the problems I really wanted answers to, was literature, was the library, was the stories I was reaching out to. So by the time I got to grade 11, Crazy Drama Dave had gotten more manic, had gotten more intense, needed more answers, and I convinced myself that I was a crap boyfriend. And the story that arose from that first girlfriend was that I was a great boyfriend. And I wasn't the hot-blooded heterosexual dude that I thought I needed to be because of romantic comedies and, to be frank, pornography. I went to porn as a young man because I was curious about sex, the totality of my sexual education being a drizzly afternoon biology lesson at my Catholic high school. <laughs> the stories I learned about sex from romantic comedies and pornography, as you can imagine, were perplexing, to say the least. The idea of being gay and having a gay identity became stronger, and when I graduated high school, I began to take it on, further muddying the waters when I found myself several years later falling for a woman who had a vagina, not a penis. <laughs> and then ultimately, I had a heavy, heavy young love relationship with her for 18 months before the inevitable passionate but earth-shattering breakup at 21 years old. It all kind of caved in at that point. I was lost. I had no idea who I was. I had alienated my friends through pursuing this girl. All I had to rely on were the stories I told myself about who I was. And it wasn't pretty. Crazy Drama Day was long dead. In his place was crap boyfriend, awful brother, worthless human being, a pathetic excuse for a man, etc, etc. Now I'd suffered from clinical depression and anxiety for years. I'd actually first been diagnosed with it when, pardon me, when I was eight. Upon turning 13 though, 
at that wonderful age where you decide you need to be normal and grown up, I have refused help from my parents and turned into a silent, stubborn teenager. Because to admit help, I needed help, I thought, meant admitting weakness. And men don't admit weakness. I needed to be independent and manly. And this is the story I stuck to and took very, very seriously. The only possible end to my story, I decided, was suicide. I found myself in a position that many young people do. In fact, it's the leading cause of death for people under the age of 25 to wipe themselves out because of a serious mental illness. One rainy afternoon, shortly before Christmas, I got in my car and drove to nowhere in particular, considering hurling myself off the road or into the path of oncoming traffic regularly. I found myself at my parents' doorstep, which is a very lucky position to be in. Not many teenagers feel like they can return, but I returned. Sobbing and still ridiculously insisting that I was fine, I just needed a glass of water. It was late at night, my father was up, but the rest of the house was sleeping. I had a strained relationship with my family for many years, and Dad and I had never really had any intimate conversations. Dad knew I was in pain, but he didn't know what to do. He did the only thing he knew how to do. He told me a story about himself. He told me a story about how he had broken up with a guy, how it had shattered his heart and left him broken at around my age. And the only way for it to feel any better was time. It will feel better. You've just got to get through it. And if you get through it, he said, it'll be the making of you. You'll never look back. Some stories are literally life-saving. Most are, at least, life-enhancing. These days, I take the stories I tell myself a little less seriously. Right now, I'm somewhat confident public speaking day. Shortly to be relieved and hungry day. <laughs> and will probably need to become quite an introverted day for a little while. But teenagers have trouble with this fluidity because the quest to define oneself is all-encompassing. Some students find it in black eyeliner. Some find it in their sexuality. Some find it in a subject they excel. Some find it in the crucifix they wear around their neck or their general, open, generic defiance to just about everything there. <laughs> and they take it very seriously. Very, very seriously. For clues, just look at the stories that they're reading. It's the Hunger Games, for example. One of the most successful young adult books in recent decades is a story about young people killing each other in a dystopian environment as they wrestle for fame. Fame, when they obtain it, is ultimately found to be empty. Kids won't read this, wouldn't read this, if they didn't find it relatable. For them, The Hunger Games is just a quick imaginative leap away from the high school environment where it's kill to survive. This is how darkly they are capable of perceiving the world. Why has The Fault in Our Stars resonated with millions of cancerless, relatively healthy young readers? Perhaps it's because they long to be subject to the kind of romance the two protagonists enjoy. One that manages to stay together despite life's most frustrating challenges and goes beyond death. The idea that they can be loved and accepted unconditionally and eternally despite their flaws. What young people read are important clues to what's going on in their most innermost self. As I said, I worship the Doctor because Crazy Drama Dave was quirky, sexless hero who longed for adoration from young female companions. I also long to play Hamlet as a 14 year old because I was having a deep existential crisis. <laughs> I also wanted to be James Bond. For obvious reasons. <laughs> Similarly, the stories that young people write are important clues about how and what they're experiencing. I'm thrilled by the fashion now of young people writing fan fiction. Fan fiction is more popular now than it's ever been. And you're going to get a fantastic speech this afternoon about fan fiction and about how important it is for young people. Because that is another integration of the stories we tell ourselves and how we can shape them. This idea that stories are over there isn't so for young people. We go in them and literally go inside them and use them as identity. I've been the facilitator in a number of workshops in all-boys schools where the subject of pornography comes up with plenty of giggles. I am blessed as an outside and visitor, to be able to not shut down this deliberate naughtiness, but to embrace what's beneath it, an expression of curiosity, and we begin exploring the topic. What actually occurs isn't a room full of horny boys verbally degrading women, as many would fear. 
is a room full of sensitive young men who end up talking about sexual confusion and gender politics and just trying to figure out what the heck is going on inside.